makes it even more serious by explaining that Christians should work hard so that we might have something to share with those who are in need. Let the former thief, he says, become the benefactor, the one who makes, uh, gives benefits to society. And so what would the world think of the church if we were known uh, by all of our benevolent efforts on behalf of the poor? We know when this happens. It's a beautiful thing. So working for, for, working for, for that reason, says Paul, is, is part of God's uniting mission in the world for the church. Another area that Paul talks about is, is as we kind of work through those moral instructions is that we need to see that a uniquely Christian life isn't primarily negative. In, in each of those commands, Paul moves from a negative to a positive, right? We, we must replace falsehood with truth. We must replace anger with forgiveness. We must replace stealing with generosity. We must replace unwholesome talk with edifying speech. And we know this about ourselves. We know this about Christians in general, that often we're known for what we are against. So sometimes we come across as censors, uh, killjoys, if you will, life-negating. Well, our text calls us to qualities and behaviors that are life-enhancing, that are liberating, that are freeing. Now, don't get me wrong, there are, there are, of course, sins that we ought to avoid. You know, just read through Paul here. He is withering in his critique of pagan society. And his words about uh, sexual impurity in the verses that follow our passage are scathing. But, but the bottom line is that God calls us to this countercultural lifestyle that focuses not first of all on law, but on love. He says, be imitators of God, therefore, and live a life of love. And to live a life of love actually is, it uses a pretty interesting word for live. Uh, in Greek, it's the word peripateo, from which we get the word peripatetic, right? Walking, wandering around. Um, Greek, to walk around. And a call to imitate our father is a call to walk the same way our father walks. Um, I, I really enjoy, uh, over my 12 years here, starting to witness and see the patterns of behavior, the patterns of action in children that reflect their parents. Even the way kids hold themselves or sit, but especially sometimes I see it in the way a child walks that looks exactly like, like the way uh, her mother walks or his father walks. Walk how your heavenly Father walks, is the instruction here. And, and some of us, we do it by very virtue of just kind of being in the presence of family and parents. And, but sometimes we actually have to make a concerted effort if we want to walk with the same graceful strides of our heavenly Father, that it takes some work. Uh, so the third feature here um, of Christian living centered clearly on forgiveness, right? The, the life of love to which we are called is a particular kind of love. Maybe you're familiar with these three kinds of biblical love, agape and eros and phileos. Um, and what's being referred to here is not the eros the, of, of the bedroom. It's not the philos, the brotherly love, the sibling of, of the kitchen table, but it's the agape, the pure love uh, of the cross, and so we're called not merely to be nice people, nice to people who like us, or just to take care of, of those people with whom we have kind of a bond of kinship. No, no. We're called to give ourselves up for those who've treated us shamefully. I mean, how can we possibly make such a sacrifice? Only by keeping our focus on the one who made such a sacrifice for us on the cross. Again, I'm not trying to take uh, lessons from my colleague and Andrew, who was here a few weeks ago playing the Greek word study game, um, but this word in Greek is helpful to us here, and it's the Greek word kathos, which means just as, or in the same way as, which Paul uses twice here. Um, and so we must be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as kathos, just as in Christ God forgave us. And we have to imitate God 
by living a life of, of love, kathos, just as in the same way that Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Just as, the same way. And, and Christian living that's worthy of that very name of being Christian is focused by this characteristic, characteristic of love. That is forgiveness and sacrifice for those who do not necessarily deserve that grace. And the final area here, um, genuine Christian living depends on and centers in the work of the Trinity. It's all about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, so we are to be imitators of God as dearly loved children. And I love this boy imitating, I assume, his father. Um, when, when we are comfortable in our own skin, when we know that we are loved, we are free to serve like Jesus. At, at his very own baptism, what happened, right? What happened at Jesus' baptism? Right? This voice comes from heaven. The Father declares, this is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased, right? The Holy Spirit's present in the dove, right? The Trinity is all present there. And at his baptism, Jesus knew that he was God's beloved Son. And that identity opens up for him this freedom to serve. I hope Katerina, I hope Caroline, I hope they one day realize their baptism, what it means that they are very beloved by God. I mean, I hope we all realize our identity as God's beloved. But we have to also remember that this text isn't just a moral lesson, that we have to work harder and behave better. Instead, we have to keep in mind this kind of overarching theme of Ephesians, that is, that our identity, our being as dearly loved children, right? We are human beings before we're human doings. And Paul's words about the Trinity set the stage for this, right? Paul says, we must do all things as dearly loved children who want to imitate the Father. And we must do these things in the same way that the Son of God does, the Son. And we can do all of these things because of the work of the Spirit in us, Father, Son, Spirit. And, and if we don't live this way, we grieve the Spirit. Uh, so we must live this way, and we can, Paul assures us, because of this huge investment that God has made in us, uh, the, the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because of that work, we are dearly loved children. Of course, when we, when we don't live this way, God doesn't terminate our adoption any more than Katerina's parents could ever stop loving her. Instead, what the Spirit does, just as any human parents do, is just as human parents weep when their children stray from the path of holiness and happiness, so does the Spirit. And, and when we see this kind of list of commandments of, about behavior, when we see it in this Trinitarian light, we can't possibly see it as requirements for salvation. This is simply the way that God's children live in a positive, life-affirming, liberating way that, that advances these purposes of God. It's also essential that we understand that all the people with whom we are in relationship are beloved of God. And I think what that does when we start to see people, other people that we're in relationship with as beloved by God, it really changes the way we treat them. If we see that they reflect the one who uh, deserves all praise. So that means we treat them like the one that they reflect. And if we live this way, our lives become then a fragrant offering that will attract people to the one who gave his life as a fragrant offering uh, and sacrifice to God. It's not a mistake on that title, even though it looks a little weird. A pastor friend of mine was asking around last week uh, what other ministers did to generate sermon titles. And somebody suggested, literally, have you tried the sermon title generator? And I didn't really know that was a thing, a sermon title generator. You plug in some words and out pop some suggested titles. And so I plugged in some words and out popped some suggested titles. And I was particularly drawn to that third one. I didn't actually make it the title of the sermon, but um, the God-like mirror people. Our mission statement says, you know, mirror Christ. And in our passage, it puts it this way, be imitators of God. 
Um, or as Spurgeon has put it, live in such a way that men and women may recognize that you have been with Jesus. Um, I sometimes get some fashion advice from my family. Uh, if my tie is crooked, they will point out, particularly after the service, that my tie was crooked all service. Um, they have other fashion advice for me as well. Uh, I have a particular pair of shorts that I got in Sierra Leone. And to describe them, my loving family uses a Creole word. They call them wo-wo, which is Creole for ugly. Uh, they'll say, Dad, not your wo-wo shorts. Um, if you're going to wear those shorts, then we're not coming with you. But the truth is I cling to some old clothes because they are particularly comfortable. And Paul knows that we cling to some, old, some parts of our old sinful selves just like we cling to old, comfortable clothes. So Paul lists some of the garments that he thinks we should put in the rag bin. And I invite you to think, what are some parts of your attire that you need to put off? Paul says, put off your old self. R remove those clothes that are soiled in sin. Get rid of your profanity-laced work shirts. Take off your gossip-stained casual wear. Remove your anger-soaked jackets. Take off your pride-soaked sports socks. Take all of your, your sin-soaked clothes and, and drown them in the waters of your baptism. And then come to that place and let God clothe you. Or as Paul puts it a couple of chapters later in Ephesians, put on. Put on these clothes. Put on the, the belt of truth and buckle it around your waist. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on footwear that leads to peace. Put on a shield of faith. Put on a helmet of salvation. And use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Take off those old, dirty, woe -oh clothes and put on new, clean clothes that God has, has laid out for you. I appreciate the the clothing that both Caroline and Katerina wore for their baptisms. And, and there's this tradition that, that baptisms have, especially for infants, of a, a baptismal gown. You know, it comes from this, this idea of putting on Christ at your baptism. Right? It, it, there's something new and fresh about it. And Paul insists, you already are in Christ. You, you weren't just baptized by water, if you were baptized by the Holy Spirit, God actually lives in you. And then Paul makes this astonishing claim that we are mirrors of God's glory. His glory, of course, not, not ours, right? So our job is to reflect away from ourselves an image of that glory that doesn't really belong to us necessarily. It belongs to God, right? So, so we've got to stop asking maybe how do I look or how am I doing or how glorious am I getting? We're not, we shouldn't spend so much time looking in the mirror and, and reflecting on ourselves, but to reflect more on mirroring the Lord. We are God-like mirror people. When, when Moses himself spent some time with God, after, after he did so, his face shone. Um, and it mirrored God's brilliance. We read in, about this in Exodus 34. And, and it's interesting that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he did not know that the skin of his face shone. And then later on in the New Testament, Paul makes a connection between us and with Moses. He says, we with unveiled faces, we all reflect the Lord's glory. We are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so I just encourage you, I invite you, I call you to, with the strength of Christ living in you, mirror God. I speak these words to you in the name of the living God whose radiance we mirror, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.